Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Develop Valid and Actionable Competency Models. My name is Luciano Gregoretti. I am a consultant here at Tenant First, and I will be conducting today's session. The webinar will last for about 30 minutes. Uh, 20 to 25 minutes will be dedicated to the presentation. Then we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, throughout the webinar, please feel free to submit any questions into the GoToMeeting panel that should be on the right side of your screen. And at the conclusion of the webinar, I will answer as many of the questions as possible. Before we start with today's discussion, I would like to remind you that this is the first of our webinar series, Seven Steps to Building top-performing organizations using competency models. Now, too often, um, unfortunately, we see many companies spend a lot of money and time developing competency models and then not using them um, to their fullest potential. So the purpose of this program is to share our experience in implementing competency systems that produce real business results. So if you haven't registered for the other webinars yet, um, you can follow the instructions to complete the registration from our website or doing the same thing from the invitation that you should have received by email. Now, let's get started with our webinar. Competencies 101. Um, in this initial part of the webinar, I will drive you through our philosophy around competencies and competency models. We will first discuss about a competency uh, model business case. We will agree on a definition and I will show you best practice and practical examples of how competencies should look like to effectively support your business. But first of all, why should any company even consider developing competency models? Here is a simple way to understand the role of competencies in an organization. So competency is to human capital as money is to financial capital. Competencies are valid, consistent, measurable and relevant criteria to hire, train, manage and develop people in an organization. So competencies are the common language to structure an integrated talent management system and provide an objective way to make key decisions and optimize investments. So without using an object objective and consistent unit of measure to guide your selection, training and development, promotion and performance management system, uh, there would be given too much space to subjective and biased decision making. Think of the damages you can cause to your business, for example, by promoting uh, an individual um, into a managerial role based on only exclusively on his past performance. Now maybe that person was a top performer as an individual contributor, but now the job is completely different uh, as well as the expectations. So the risk is that the new manager cannot replicate his past, um, maybe even outstanding performance uh, because does not have the right competencies to succeed in a new role. And the, con the consequence of this could be detrimental for his career could be painful for his employees and cause a big money loss for the company. So the only way to really avoid all of this is by having a model that tells exactly what are the competencies required to succeed at all level, all levels, I'm sorry, in order to base any decisions and investments on valid, consistent, measurable and relevant criteria. So what are other uh, practical advantages of using competency models? Well, competency models help, help people gain a better understanding of performance expectations. And the difference between job descriptions and competency models is that job descriptions describe the duties, areas of accountability, and desired outcomes. While well, competency models tell people how they are expected to perform in order to manage successfully those accountabilities and achieve the desired outcomes. The competency models also provide a clear roadmap for success that let employees take ownership of their professional development. When effectively applied 
through the different talent management processes, a competency models can improve individual and team performance by letting people know what are those behaviors that drive to the achievement of top results. The competency models can also make the life of a manager much easier. In fact, our competency models facilitate coaching, performance appraisal discussions, and help managers making better hiring decisions. So all of this impact the entire organization. Studies show that companies that use competency models as the foundational element of their talent management systems have lower turnover rates, higher talent retention, and higher productivity. And on top of that, competency models allow leadership to gain a better alignment of individual behaviors with companies' missions, strategies, and goals. So let's back up for a moment. What are competences? Competences are skills, knowledge, and abilities that are applied for specific outcomes. So most of the approaches define competencies simply as skills, knowledge, and abilities. But if you're not applying for specific outcomes, are you really competent? So what we do here at Talent First, we include the application and outcomes for a more comprehensive definition of competency. So you can have all the skills, knowledge, and ability of this world, but if you're not achieving outcomes, then technically you're not competent. So skills, knowledge, and abilities that are applied for specific outcomes. Now we talked about what competencies are. Now let's talk about how competency models need to be. Well, we have a very practical viewpoint around competency models and talent management in general. So we believe that to be effective, competency models need to be clear and simple, need to be targeted, and need to be actionable, in the meaning that they need to be applied easily in practice. Now, while controversial to say, competencies are not worth the paper to print it on if they can't be used effectively in practice. And for instance, we've been asked to come into organizations that have already developed and deployed competency models and identify why they're not being used as effectively as they could be or not be used at all. Now, one common issue that we find is that some models have way too many competency dimensions, in some cases, over 20. Now, this may look impressive, uh, but realistically, it is impossible for people to focus on that many skills areas. So, packaging overshadows substance and practicality. As a rule, we advocate the identification and development of no more than five or six competency areas in any given model. So, keep it simple, keep it targeted, and keep it actionable. Today or tomorrow. So, should competency models be focused more on today or tomorrow? And we've been asked this question all the time. It is important that competency models not only describe what success looks like today, but also what the expectations are for the future. And this way, you're not only actively bridging the gap between present state and future state, but you're also optimizing the system, sustainability, and longevity. And to this point, however, you really need to balance between what is really actionable today and what is more uh, aspirational. Because you don't want your competency system overly lofty and unrealistic uh, because then it, it won't be usable. So we advise the rule of thumb above. 75% of the models should be uh, critical today and 25% should be future focused. Now one big question um, when looking to the future is, what kind of organization mindset are you trying to build? And something you should consider when you're asking these questions are business context, strategy, direction, customer requirement, competitive threats, application of the system, and impact of the system on the corporate culture. One important thing to remember is that competencies, they're not static. They need to live and grow with your organization. So there are different types of competency model structures 
But when you're talking about using them to drive your supporting talent management tools and system, you really need enough content to effectively create them. So one approach we advocate is develop a multi-stage model or family of models uh, that you can see here in the slide. Because very rarely you will apply uh, the entire model all at once. Um, for instance, selection guides are typically written against the behaviors outlined in the learning and applying stage. Uh, and on the other hand, to understand if someone is ready for moving to a higher level roles, you would look for the demonstration of leading and expert behaviors. So let's see what a competency model looks like. This is actually an extract of a model we designed for a sales organization uh, not, a, not a long time ago. So we got a title, customer engagement. Uh, we got a definition, cultivates relationships with key decision makers and applies persuasive consultative selling skills to increase access and gain product support to achieve company and customer objectives. Build purposeful internal and external networks to develop and drive collaborative value-added solutions. So you can see that even in the definition of the broad competency, the behaviors are always applied for specific outcomes. Now moving down, there is a success factor. Um, in this case, influencing and consultative skills, uh, selling. And each competency has a minimum of two and usually no more than five success factors. Um, and then there are the behavior descriptors of each proficiency level, learning, applying, leading, and expert. Now, of course, um, this is our approach, uh, and specifically this is an approach that we use with this organization. Uh, there are other valid methods and other valid structures, but besides what path you decide to take, we always recommend to keep it simple, keep it targeted, and keep it actionable in order to achieve better results. All right, now we've covered um, all the fundamentals of the competencies and competency models. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the process that we use here at Talent First uh, to develop and then launch competency models. The big things are making sure that competency models are valid and you engage and though drive ownership across the organization. For instance, it is very hard to criticize something that you have created. And this does not actually mean that you have to drag people through hours of interviews or focus groups and development time. Benjamin Franklin used to say, time is money. And it really is. So while engaging people in the process, you need to be efficient and minimize disruption. So foundation studies how we call our organizational analysis process here at Talent First. It really takes 45 minutes or so for each person to participate in the process, but the beauty is everyone participates. A few weeks ago, I was presenting the foundation study to one of our clients, and there was a leader in the room who asked me, why can't we just ask top performers to describe their behaviors and then we create the model out of that. So there are two risks of using this approach. Um, first of all, how can you differentiate the behaviors of top talents with the behaviors of average and low performers? Second, how else can you ensure and maximize buy-in and then adoption across the organization? So the foundation study allows to achieve both goals. It helps create a valid model and involving everyone in the process you get people to buy in and use the model in their everyday life. So leadership interviews, job analysis, job function survey, and behavioral insights are the four steps of the foundation study. So we typically start um, the foundation study with the leadership interviews. And we ask leaders about what are their expectations and their perspective about the position uh, or the job families under study. Since leader, leaders have a more of a systemic vision of the business, uh, they also know the strategies and they have a better understanding of companies' future directions, 
they can provide valuable inputs that would be very difficult to find otherwise. So we recommend to interview leaders when developing a competency model also to ensure their buy-in on the project, which is really important. On average, the interviews are 45 to 60 minutes long. Um, and to maximize the effectiveness of the space, we recommend to create a very good uh, interview protocol and have the ability to establish positive rapport with the interview. So second phase of the foundation study is the job analysis. Um, it consists in a full day job shadowing that allows to gather in-depth data around skills, knowledge, knowledge and abilities that drive greater outcomes and results. The observations should be targeted on all type of performers, top average and low, and low uh, in order to build a valid model. The data collected with the job analysis and the leadership interview would also simplify the construction of the job function survey, which is the following step of the foundation study. And here again, to guarantee effectiveness of a process, um, you need specific skills. Uh, for example, the job analyst is very important that is able to observe and register behaviors and events in a real life environment without altering the course of action. So the job function survey is the third step of the foundation study and is deployed with the purpose of collecting data from a large number of individuals. So we advise to administer the survey to those people who did not participate in the previous steps of the study. And by involving all people in that specific role, not only you will be able to create a more comprehensive and targeted model, but you will also ensure buy-in and adoption. And just as the previous phases, Designing and deploying a survey requires specific competencies in order to ensure rigor in each step of the process. So in the fourth part of the foundation study process, we conduct an analysis of the innate traits that distinguish top performers by others. For this intent, we use the behavioral insight which is a valid and reliable proprietary assessment tool that measures 14 core behavioral traits. We deployed the behavioral insight to the world, popula world population on the study uh, and analyzed the statistical correlations between performance and the 14 traits uncovered by the behavioral insight. So once the model is created, um, we always recommend a proper launching phase. In fact, launching a competency, a competency system and any competency-based tools is just as important as developing them. A competency launch enables leadership to roll out and garner organizational support in a most effective manner. And this is actually an area where we see companies falling short many times. And what I mean by that is underestimating its value. So you're setting new expectations for your team or organization that, if done right, should change how people approach their jobs and ultimately the results they achieve. And you need to give it the justice it deserves because of that. So I hope it's clear now that competency models are not just, you know, another fancy looking yet not very useful HR initiative. Competency models are a business initiative. And when done right, competency models allow to change expectations and ultimately change the outcomes. And that's huge. So we are at the end of uh, this presentation. Um, but before starting the Q&A session, um, I would like to remind you that the next webinar of the series, Competency-Based Talent Development, um, we'll be on air on June 24th at 1 p.m. East Time and uh, June 26th at 3 p.m. East Time. Um, if you haven't registered yet, um, you will find the links in uh, the registration email or visiting our website www.talentfirst.com.
Okay, so I see that we have a lot of questions, uh, and I will try to answer as many questions as possible. First question, can you give an example of how you link competency models to business strategy? Uh, sure, um, I will give you an example of a competency model we developed for a pharmaceutical company uh, a few months ago. So part of the business strategy was to overcome obstacles that were blocking sales. So the first problem uh, for, this is for a um, sales representative. So the, for, the first problem was the difficulty of the reps to get access to physicians in order to sell their products. Um, and the other problem was uh, around the reimbursement, reimbursement process. So the behaviors that top performers applied to overcome those obstacles were incorporated in the model, raising the performance bar for the entire sales organization. So the model was also integrated um, in coaching, development and training, and performance management with the purpose of, on one side, um, uh, to ensure that people had enough resources to uh, achieve better results, uh, and on the other side, to keep people accountable in order to meet those new standards. So this is um, one example of a competency models, how competency models can uh, be linked to business strategy. How do you assess competency models initially and over time? Uh, well, good question. So after launching a model, we typically recommend companies to benchmark the competency level of the roles uh, that the model was created for. This, pro this process actually uh, is, um, we, have, um, we have a part of our software, iCoach First, which uh, makes it completely automated. Uh, we call this process the proficiency assessment. Uh, and we're actually, we're going to talk about the competency proficiency assessment in the next webinar. So if you want to know more about it, uh, I recommend you to register and watch it. So question number three, what are the biggest problems you usually face when developing competency models? Uh, well, that's, that's another great question. So um, one problem I can think right now is creating a model that is too rigid and overly prescriptive. So the behaviors that lead to success that are captured in the model, they need to be specific enough to, be, to bring clarity um, around what success look like, looks like, but also they need to be broad enough to accept some variability. And with variability, I mean, for example, um, different approaches to achieve goals that could be equally effective, um, and also changes in the environment that now more than ever are very frequent. So you need to find really like what's the right balance to have a model uh, that brings clarity around performance expectations that could be used from people to improve their performance, but they're not overly rigid. So another problem uh, that we usually see, and we've talked about this uh, during the webinar, um, is getting enough buy-in on the model to ensure consistent application. I know we talk about it already, but I, I want to stress this concept uh, because I think it's very critical. Um, so one of the reasons why we do the foundation study this way is actually to overcome this barrier. So limited buy-in is a risk that can be largely prevented by deploying uh, the foundation study. Then after the model is launched, of course, you, you, know, you created buy-in, you created uh, identification, you created excitement around the model, um, but you need to make sure that the model would be um, integrated in other talent management systems in order to ensure that that will be actually adopted to achieve the desired outcomes. Um, thinking about um, other problems, well, Definitely one is about um, having a good project team. Uh, that's more of a problem. That's, uh, that's a best practice. So um, the project team is very important, um, and it needs to be formed at the beginning. And the project team owns the project, the competency project, internally. 
So not only um, the people in the team provide inputs for the validation of the model, but they also contribute to other important phases, including the communication. Now we usually support our clients uh, with the communication planning um, and execution. Sometimes we actually manage the whole process, but it's important that an internal project team send out the communications and do and participate to most of the presentations. So having a core team is very important and not giving enough uh, relevance can compromise validity uh, but also engagement. Um, let's see another question. So do you recommend to use off-shelf competency models if yes, in what case is a good solution? Uh, yeah, I mean, personally, I'm not a huge fan of uh, off-shelf competency models. I don't think that um, in this case is one size fits all. Um, I advocate personally to develop competencies that are tailored on specific roles and specific companies. Say that um, there are ways to make this shortcut more effective and uh, reduce risk. One approach we have used in the past with clients that specifically require to, um, to adopt this approach is to start from a library of competencies and then modify to refinement sessions. Now, this approach can be uh, a good compromise to save money, save time, uh, while maintaining uh, a good general validity. Um, there are different uh, scenarios where um, when this approach could be um, more effective than others. Um, for example, we, what we did in the past was using this approach when the company was um, small or, or a medium-sized company. And the results were pretty good. Or um, another situation, um, this approach could be used um, is when there are in the same company similar roles that already had a model uh, and you can leverage that model to create a new one. Uh, but in general, uh, validity and engagement could be largely, largely reduced by approaching uh, a competency model in this way. Okay, so we are uh, at the end of our webinar. Um, I see some of you asked for a copy of the presentation. Yeah. What I'm going to do, I will send you a link to download the PDF uh, version of uh, the presentation. And I will also send you um, the recorded version, version of the webinar uh, within a, a couple of days. If it's not tomorrow, it will be on Monday. And of course, um, if you need other information, um, you can reach out to me anytime here on the right side of the screen. You have my contact information, my phone number, and my email. So thank you for joining us today and being part of this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you were able to learn something new and useful for your job. And I hope we will have you on board for the next webinars. Have a great rest of the day.